Hi, everyone, and welcome to episode 128 of the Medieval Podcast. I'm Danielle Sapolsky, also known as the 5 Minute Medievalist. Well, the latest medieval movie has just dropped into theaters, and that means that yours truly was first in line, masked, vaxxed, and socially distanced in order to bring you the goods. This week, Peter Kinechny and I discuss Ridley Scott's latest film, The Last Duel, starring Jodie Comer, Matt Damon, Ben Affleck, and Adam Driver. The movie closely follows a famous 14th century trial by combat as it's explored in the book of the same name by Eric Jagger, who I had the pleasure of speaking with in the last episode of the podcast. As with the episode in which we talked about the movie The Green Knight, Peter and I speak pretty freely in this episode about a whole lot of the stuff leading up to the trial, so if you hate spoilers in general, come back to this one when you've seen the movie for yourself. If you don't care about a whole bunch of minor spoilers, but you don't want to find out how it ends, I'll give you a big spoiler alert countdown so you can pause the episode before you find out. As I mentioned last week, The Last Duel is an account of a real historical rape trial, and the movie and our discussion might well be triggering for some people. If you need to skip this episode for your own mental well-being, or if you have kids around and want to wait, that's always okay. After this week, we'll be leaving this subject behind for a while. And so, without further ado, it's time for our take on Ridley Scott's latest trip back in time with The Last Duel. Welcome back, Peter. It is time to talk about The Last Duel, the movie. Hey, hey, oh, I know. And we're about 48 hours from watching it, so we've had our thoughts about it. Yes, we've done nothing but think about it since over the (laughs) last couple days. I I dreamt about it, indeed. So let's talk about it. So this is the new movie that is directed by Ridley Scott, who is not unfamiliar to people who love medieval movies. What did you think of it overall? I quite liked it. I, I thought it, it was very, very well done and gave a real authentic look with how they designed it, it for the Middle Ages, with a few exceptions. But I thought the story was really well done. I liked how it was presented. I give a thumbs up. Yeah, I think it was. I think it was well done, as you say. I mean. It's never going to be completely accurate. We're talking about medieval film, right? We're talking about entertainment. So it's always going to have taken some liberties and they definitely do that. But I think that it's got appeal for people who come to the Middle Ages in terms of movies for the graphic warfare that's there. And then costumes are great. And then I think that the storytelling is really good as well. Yeah, indeed. It's not a documentary and we should never expect it to be one. But at the you know, same time, like yeah, I, I want to kind of feel like this would be a tale told in the Middle Ages. I think that's it got mostly right. So I'm happy with that. Yes. Well, it is based on a true case. And again, this is a difficult case. I, it's one of the reasons why I wonder how many people are going to go see it at the movies, because it is based on a rape trial that is appealed to the King of France and ends up being a trial by combat between two men. Uh, the woman, Marguerite, her husband, and the man that she's accused, who Well, I mean, I'm going to take her side. I've said this in the podcast that we did already with Eric Jagger, who who wrote the book. And I think that Marguerite's telling the truth. So from my point of view, it's her husband and the actual man who attacked her. So those are the people that are in a trial by combat. It's not a duel. A lot of medievalists have already pointed this out. And we mentioned it as well in the podcast with Eric Jagger. It's not a duel, but... Sometimes you got to stretch words a little bit, I think, if you want to bring the people. And that's that's what was done for the original title of that book. And so this is following that as it, well. Dueling emerges later, more of a renaissance thing. And so this is good one with the first duel, but that's, that's probably not true either. So <laughs> It's and, not the first and, duel. And I, I can see why. We're not going to call it the last trial by combat. And this is, happens when trial by combat is a very rare thing, mm-hmm. which, which they don't. They only kind of allude to it slightly, but this certainly would have been amazingly huge news in kind of the court life of uh, late 14th century France because none of them would have ever seen such a thing like this. Yes. For the people who didn't catch our last podcast about this, in quick summary, Marguerite's husband, Jean de Carouge, feels like he hasn't had a correct judgment from his overlord, who is the Count Count Pierre d'Alençon, and he appeals this to the King of France and asks specifically for a trial by combat. And everyone is quite 
amazed by this because as you say, Peter, like this is rare. Nobody's doing this. And you have to meet a whole bunch of credentials. You have to check a whole bunch of boxes before you can actually get to a trial by combat. So this is very rare. And a lot of people took interest in this story. Okay, so let's talk about it as a film. How is it laid out, Peter? How they tell the story? After kind of a, a bit of an introduction with your obligatory battle scene, mm-hmm. they do move in and say it in three through the three characters. This is the truth according to Carouge. This is the truth according to Legree, and then the truth according to Marguerite, which is the truth. So they they tell the story, and there are many scenes that are retold with some in all three versions. So you see it again, but slightly differently. Mm-hmm. And, uh, I, and I, that was a very powerful impact on me. I, I really quite like that kind of filmmaking. Why did it speak to you? It, it, it made me want to pay very close attention to details, right? Like once you see it like, oh, this is happening again. I'm trying to look at the nonverbal cues. In particular, you're looking at one person's face, and that reaction of that face. And then you're looking like just slight differences in some of the more pivotal scenes that like you can kind of see it. Oh, there's this happening that doesn't happen in the other scene. And just even how it's filmed, you know, I thought it was a very good way of doing it. Yeah, I think so too, because each person's perspective adds something to this story. But as you say, in each version of events, they are using the same movements, they are using the same lines. And so you have to rely on nonverbals or different emphasis on different words to see how this might have been taken differently by each of the people who's telling the story. And you also know that each of the person who's telling their version of the story is telling it in a light that's beneficial to them. And so that's interesting too. You're coming at it thinking, What part of this is colored by their own feelings behind this? Yes. Carouge's character, in his own telling, he comes across as an honorable, if not like a tough man. You wouldn't say you'd be his friend, (laughs) but you can understand where he's coming from. But in the other verses, he comes off far, far worse. He is much more of a hothead. Yes, definitely. And again, one of the things about having it being told from these different perspectives is you get to see how culture has shaped each of these people. And Carouge, in his mind, is acting like a true knight. He is doing all the things he should be doing. He's standing up for his rights. He's standing up for his wife against injustice. When it comes to petty things that we learn about at the beginning of the film, well, maybe not petty because it is land rights and things like that. He's already making trouble with his overlord over that stuff. And in his mind, which is what you see from his perspective, this all makes very good sense. And it's not irrational at all. When you see that from the other people's perspective, <laughs> it's a totally different story. Like Karush goes in, in for another campaign and like Reeves asks, well, well, you know, why are you doing it for honor? So, well, you know, I actually just need the money. <laughs> <laughs> It's true. We should probably mention that Jean de Carouge, who's Marguerite's husband, is played by Matt Damon. So if you've seen the trailer, it's Matt Damon's character that we're talking about. That's the hothead. Legree, who is the villain of the story, except for in his mind, is played by Adam Driver. And of course, Marguerite's played by Jodie Comer. No one is going to get her confused because she's pretty much the only woman in this story at all. At least the one with any dialogue. (laughs) Well, the mother-in-law does have a couple of words, but not a lot. So culturally is really interesting too. If we talk about Legree, this is a difficult thing to talk about, I think. And it's something that is with us still. When you get Legree's perspective on this account, it is that he has done nothing wrong either. And what I really liked about the film was the way they set this up as, again, being informed by a culture, not only a court culture, which is led by Pierre D'Alençon, the Count, who's played by Ben Affleck, where everybody is very loose with their morals and it's very much a court culture where there's pursuit involved. And in this movie, they also have Adam Driver reading from a book that has the rules of love in it. And this is It's going back to Ovid. I don't remember from watching the movie a few days ago if this is the version of it that is in Andreas Capellanes' book, but it's exactly courtly love ideas about who you are supposed to fall in love with and the comportment you're supposed to have. And part of that is that women are supposed to put up some resistance for the sake of their own reputation and that men are supposed to overcome this. And 
I think the movie is very good at showing that it's still very much a crime and that Legree, he knows it's a crime, but he's able to kind of twist this in his own mind to be kind of a courtly love situation instead of a crime. Yeah, very much indeed. You get hints like how he kind of treats women and his lord treats women. He's like, this is how it should be done. There are some gratuitous scenes, a couple of them that, you know, I don't think should have been in the movie, but they obviously put it in there. Well, um, yeah, it's medieval. You have to have naked ladies there yeah. for no reason at all, but decoration. <laughs> yeah, it was it was literally a Game of Thrones moment. Right, exactly. But like, I think he wanted to kind of give the idea that this is, in his mind, acceptable because that's what kind of would happen in the court. Mm -hmm. And I think that was really important so that you could see how he might exculpate himself from this as a crime. But I really do appreciate that the film still shows it as it still is a crime. And he probably knows that even though he's trying to convince himself otherwise. One of the things that they have in the movie that Eric Jagger and I got off the podcast last time and we both went, oh no, we forgot to talk about benefit of clergy. And they do have the benefit of clergy in the movie. So Peter, tell people about what benefit of clergy is doing in this movie. Oh yeah. So uh, there's a longstanding rule, I guess, that if you were a clergy, no matter how, how minor it could be, a student can be involved in clergy you can say, I don't want to be tried in a secular court. I will have an ecclesiastical court. And that was often given if you were accused of a murder or something like that, with the expectation that you would get a less uh, severe sentence. And Legree says towards the early, early part of his story that, yeah, like I was going to be in the clergy, but it just wasn't for me. And so he is actually a bit learned. He can read, he can write. And so the, there was an idea, like, uh, when he gets accused, that he can take this vow and go to clergy, and this can be all done with. And I think it's part of the idea is, like, there are ways you can cover up the crime, you can cover up the rumors and innuendo and things like that. But he doesn't want to do that for his own honor. Right. So what's important to remember here is that rape is a capital crime. It is a serious crime. And so while most people are not executed for it, it's very problematic when it comes to the medieval legal system. Some people were forced to marry their rapists to make it, <laughs> what's the correct word for it, to make it legit, I suppose. But if you were accused of that and you took your benefit of clergy and said, listen, I was trained up in the church, that would mean that you get penance. So you were under no danger of being executed. You wouldn't have to do a trial by combat. If you claim the benefit of clergy, you would just get penance. It could be a lot. It could be like bread and water for quite some time, well, well, it but could, it's it, definitely it could, a better option. Well, it could have meant imprisonment within a monastery for him, but we don't get that uh, in the film. If you claim benefit of clergy, this is all going to be swept under the rug. Yeah, you do get that in the film where it seems like they'll hide it for you, which is not exactly true. You'd still have to go through the ecclesiastical court. You'd still get in trouble. But he wants to clear his name. What I thought was interesting, though, is that they definitely didn't have that in the movie. It's in the trial accounts. He could have claimed benefit of clergy. He could have not had to go to trial by combat. So it's interesting that they put that in there because that is something that you have to really explain to people. They're not going to understand that right off the bat. So they took the time in the film to explain that to people, which I thought was a really interesting choice. Yeah, I think it was also very well done how they like we we talked about how well it was written i think part of it is like they make these explanations fairly quickly they don't go into the details but at the same time they explain it they don't leave any kind of confusion yeah there's a couple of places where they do that uh, a lot of them are to do with medieval medicine or law or little bits like that and even if it's not completely right. It's really interesting that they take a second to do that. One of the things that they have in the trial in the movie is they're asking Marguerite about whether she enjoyed this experience or not, because they get at in the film, the fact that women were expected to have to enjoy a sexual encounter in order to get pregnant. And so 
They mentioned this very heavily in the trial, and I think that they're doing this for the modern audience because this is something that is still around, unfortunately. But I thought they explained that pretty well, the thinking behind that in the movie. Now, we do have a really interesting article, which we should link to in the, the show notes, Peter, by Sarah McDougall and David Perry. And they mentioned that this wouldn't have been in the trial. People wouldn't have asked that in the trial. But I think people would have been discussing that around the trial amongst themselves. That's one of the cases where you have to present to a modern audience. So the, the filmmakers can't weave off and expect us to understand medieval ways of thinking, right? Mm -hmm. I think it asks too much uh, from a modern audience to like, all right, let's get into the nitty gritty of medieval ideas of sexuality and all the nuances that do not exist for the last 100 years, at least. Yeah. Uh, you are trying to talk to a modern audience in many ways, like where they say, well, uh, a woman can only get, get pregnant if she's enjoying the sexual or contact. And they say, well, that's science. That We know that's that's the science, right? That's actually I think, the yeah. quote. And yeah. that's a very much a reference to something that happened a couple of years ago where I think an American lawmaker had this idea. And they, he was calling it, oh, yeah, that's what I know as science and scientific fact, and which is pure dribble. So. <laughs> That's a very polite way of putting it. Yes, it's pure <laughs> dribble. Exactly. <laughs> and I think that was a very much a nod. Hey, you know, people that think like that right now had that medieval way of thinking, which is not, yeah. even, it was not even a medieval way of thinking. Well, they do a couple of things like that where they are making modern parallels purposefully. And I'm kind of on the fence about I really get where they're coming from. For example, the actual attack on Marguerite in the testimony that we have from the Middle Ages involves two people, two men are involved in restraining her. And in the film, only one, only Legree is involved in this. And this, I think, well, it kind of skirts around the fact that you never have to talk about the accomplice, right? You never have to find out what happened to him. That would have taken more screen time. But I think it's also meant to speak to modern trials and modern cases where this has happened there's a he said she said thing and so they've changed that so it's it's one of these things where i kind of think in some ways it's not kind to the actual historical marguerite who had this trauma but at the same time it is a fictional story we know it's a fictional story it's like quote unquote based on true events and so if it's put to the service of making a statement about today I understand where they're coming from and it works in the film to get at that. And it, it's ridiculous to imagine that a film doesn't have a point of view that they're trying to get across. Yeah, This yeah. is how they do that in this. And I, I think in service to the film, it works. You know, I'm still on the fence about whether, whether they should have picked a different story for that reason, but I get where they're coming from. It comes across to me like they have to make Marguerite's story, right? And unfortunately, like the records we have from in the book, she is always kind of one step away because in the historical accounts, this is a he said, he said. Yeah. Event. And Sarah right. and David mentioned that in their article. Yeah, I want to yeah. give them credit for that, too. So I don't think a film like this could be made if it was so faithful to the book that her story is somehow not told. Imagine us getting this story, but only through Matt Damon's <laughs> character, right? Yeah. In that way, you would get more of a remove from the woman's story herself. And in terms of filmmaking, that's not as powerful, I don't think. You really want to have sympathy for this woman, this character in terms of film. And so I think that's another reason why they went with that, where she's actually doing her own speaking. And I mean, Sarah and David make the good point. Is this fair to her? Because all of a sudden, she's more voiceless the actual Marguerite. So that's something I think we should all think about. But in terms of this actual film, in terms of how it actually fits together as a movie, I can't understand why they made those choices. Okay, so we've talked about Jean de Carouge's version of events where he's a chivalric hero. He's so knightly, which no one else sees that way when they get to tell their own story. Then we have Legree, who comes out from his perspective, where this is a courtly love thing. Then we have Marguerite, and we get to see more of her life before the attack. What was it like? And this is one of my least favorite parts, oh. because 
they tried. I mean, kudos to Ridley Scott and the script writers for trying to show her as being very independent in a lot of ways. And she's she's making decisions about the household. She's taking on the account. She's doing all of these things. But somehow it And doing what, a much better job than Karouche, right? She's like, doing a much better job than her husband. And that's fair. She's she's the real Marguerite was probably educated and French women were noble women were trained to take over a household if their husband is gone, especially they were trained to run it. So that's what they're trying to get at. But somehow it doesn't land as heavily as when she's talking about buying a new dress. <laughs> so it's like, oh, like we're almost there. But she's still like talking about dresses. <laughs> so it's like, oh, okay. <laughs> I didn't love that because it's like, well, all right. She's talking about dresses. <laughs> you get her and her mother-in-law bickering. And like, mm-hmm. that's, that's just an old trope, right? Yeah, uh, although I think it was also true, but yes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, she doesn't talk business with her friends. She no, doesn't she doesn't talk, talk business, no. You know, like, she doesn't talk about running things and stuff like that. It's, oh, who you're meeting? Who's your husband? It doesn't play well. She has, like, two characters in that early part. That is really kind of stereotypical in a lot of ways. And her husband in her story, which is the true story, and that they emphasize that in the film. This is this is meant to be the true story. Her husband is awful and her life is awful. And they have some really heavy handed scenes with like this mayor who gets impregnated, who has like no control over her life. And it's not necessary. It's not necessary for Carouge to be a terrible husband. And it's not necessary for their marriage to be terrible. I mean, if we're going to fictionalize it anyway, we could make it nicer. But it's yeah, got to be but, medieval. <laughs> I wonder if it would have been better if Carouge was just more clueless. Every kind of scene, especially the ones where we have double views of it, right? His version and the other person's version are so different, right? And he's so much more yeah. of a hothead and an idiot that <laughs> there's nothing redeeming about him. Yeah. And I think that is probably a disservice to the historical narrative. But like, yeah, we just don't know too much, right? Yeah. And I did this review for Medieval Astana where I said he kind of slips into stereotype. He's the one character that really kind of slips into stereotype because we do have Marguerite running the farm and or the manor, which is more than you'd see in many other films about medieval women. But it's not necessary, like I said, for them to have a bad marriage, but they do. And it's for contrast. I think it's just for filmmaking and to speak to the people who have only seen medieval movies. They're not specialists. And so, yeah, I think it could have been a bit more nuanced, but maybe they thought that would be confusing to the audience. I don't know. One of my favorite things about this movie is So we talked about Marguerite and her mother-in-law being pretty much the only women that talk. There's a cousin, I think, who's not very nice. But there are lots of women that are still in the background. And they're even in the background in places where they may not necessarily have been in the background in real life, like in the French parliament. And their body language speaks volumes. And I love that. Didn't you notice that too, Peter? Yes, yes. I think the best actress without a a speaking role goes to the Queen of France. So, yes. And yeah, I, I quite noticed lots of visuals like that. And that, I think that's just, that's just part of the really good writing and acting. Yeah. And I think that's the director's vision as well, where he's, he's got a shot of the King of France, but the queen behind there is being given the direction that she should be looking uncomfortable with what he's saying. And, Count Pierre's wife is also very uncomfortable with some of the things that he's saying, kind of this dismissive masculine culture, which is appropriate to the Middle Ages. It's not inappropriate to have this bro kind of attitude, but the women behind it are speaking with their eyes. And I think that is really great, especially when you have a film where they don't have a lot of lines. They're still speaking in a lot of ways. And I think in a subtle way, that really kind of gets at the role of women in the Middle Ages, where even in places where they were not supposed to be speaking, they were still taking in all this information and they still had thoughts about this information. And you imagine the Queen of France going off and speaking to someone else about this off camera, which I thought was a brilliant part of the film. One one of the things I really liked about this film was in pretty much all the scenes, there are a lot of people 
in say a room or, or at an event or something like that. We rarely have like kind of two people, which is so different from the last movie we talked about, Sir Gowan, the, the, the Green Knight, which was usually just one or two people if, at best. <laughs> but in this one, yeah, there are, there's a lots of things that are going on in every scene. I think as a medievalist, this is probably something I'm probably going to want to watch a couple times more just to get in all the background. It's great for that. And I'm glad that you brought that up because in real medieval life, if you go to court, it's full of people. There's always people. You never see that in a medieval movie, I think for budgetary reasons. But when it's Ridley Scott, (laughs) you don't have the budgetary problems. You can have a room full of people. And so that was great because you do have all these extras who are emoting in the background and really adding to it, like you said. During the kind of feast scene, uh, there's even like a guy sleeping in the background. And I can just imagine that servant sleeping against the wall. Uh, but <laughs> it allows for a lot more of those, those visual kind of cues and things like that to kind of be thrown in there, right? Mm-hmm. Also, the costuming was very good. I mean, the military historians are going to jump all over this and say, nobody's faces were covered in the war scenes. Nobody's faces were covered in the actual fighting scenes. Yes, 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 absolutely. When we're talking about costumes, it's really nice to have a set full of people in costume because you start to forget that you're looking at something that is medieval. And I thought that that was one of the strengths of the film too, where sometimes you have a movie that's set in the Middle Ages and you cannot forget that this is people playing in the Middle Ages. And here you have just people and that's what they're wearing. And it seems quite normal. And I really like that because that is what people were wearing. It was very normal to hang out in the court wearing that big giant hat and stuff. It it, it seemed normal, which is something that I think is rare when you see a medieval film. Some people have been commentating on the hair. We need to get to the hair. (laughs) (laughs) What do you think of the hair? <laughs> uh, are they looking at manuscripts for the hairstyles? I don't know. It's It seems all over. Like everyone has kind of different hairstyles. And I think it's almost made to just to emphasize their character in that. Yeah. I read an article about this because I needed to look up what was going on here. And according to the article I read, so like don't quote me, this is an article and I don't remember where it came from, but this is really Scott's idea for what especially Ben Affleck and Matt Damon's hair were supposed to look like. And if you've seen the trailer, you've seen the movie, you know Ben Affleck has a terrible bleach job and I don't really understand why. And it wasn't really explained in the article except for that they trusted really Scott's vision on this. But apparently the mullet thing, the idea was that Carouge's character is so not interested in vanity. He's so interested in warfare that all he cares about is being able to get his helmet on. So just cut the sides, cut the front so he can fit his helmet on and that's fine. We'll go. It, I don't it, think it works. Yeah, well, I, th- I can see it like it gives him that hick look, I guess. Yeah, it's trying to speak to modern people too, I think. But it's really distracting. It's really it's distracting. Like, like, like I was distracted by Ben Affleck's Count Pierre's hair, but like I understand where they're going for our. I, Do I think you? Because I, I don't. People could, you know, get their hair blonde back then, right? If they wanted to, they could bleach it. I know at least in the 15th century they could. In Italy, there were recipes for that. But he has to stand out, right? That's one of the ways he can do it. I don't think I don't think Ben Affleck could stand out in those kind of scenes because there's so many people in these scenes. Oh, I think he could. In fact, let's talk about Ben Affleck for a second because I thought he did really well in this role. I, I thought he stuck out in every yeah. <laughs> in every yeah. scene. I think he yeah, knocked it out of the park. Probably not a, a super stretch for him as a character. <laughs> <laughs> wow, Peter. <laughs> Sorry, Ben, if you're listening to this, Peter said that. I did not say that. But I thought it was good. He is a counterpoint. Whoa, that was a count joke. I didn't even realize it was coming out. He's a counterpoint to the other characters in that he is a little funny. And that's okay. But I think that he still, I think that he has a really subtle performance here where he seems very lighthearted or he doesn't care about a lot of stuff but he does have that kind of core of steel which is necessary for yeah. a count and he, i i think he does that well especially for the very first few scenes you see him he is very weird right and then it, it turns on like when he, he has a scene where he's he talks about the the business you then see like 
he has this public presentation, but when, when you see him like one-on-one, he is a lot sharper. He's sharp, he knows, and he's almost like, what I do in front of the big crowd is not me. And what I am is this guy in the back that's kind of worried about money too. And he knows like, oh yeah, I'm going to do it this way. And like, I thought he, he did that really well. Yeah. I mean, he is a person who is a king's cousin. And so he comes from a place where he knows how much power he has and he knows he can do what he wants with it. And he is very much an enabler. If we're talking back to the plot of Legree, he's a an enabler in lots of ways. And he's vindictive against Carouge. And I think that that's fair from the historical accounts. He seems to have a grudge. He seems to have a grudge. Because he just but... doesn't like him. Yeah, he doesn't like him. And I can understand why from seeing the movie, why he doesn't like him, because nobody likes Carouge. So Ben Affleck does a very good job at kind of conveying both this kind of showmanship of Count and as the, the politician and Lord. Yeah. I do want to come back to that contentiousness between Carouge and Count Pierre. They just call him Pierre in there, which I think is a little bit not quite right. But I think it's, again, not to confuse the audience. Like, you're not going to call your Count, hey, Pierre. But anyway, <laughs> what I liked about it was historically and in the film, Carouge has sued Count Pierre twice over land and over a position. And so this encounter where he's asking for justice in the name of Marguerite is the third time that he's butted heads with Count Pierre. At least that is recorded in Eric's book or that's recorded in the film. But what I like about it was nothing in the film suggested that this trial was vindictiveness on the part of Carouge. Like nothing in this suggested that this was just him bringing this forward as another way of revenge or pettiness or using his wife. Is this possible historically? Could he have brought this forward just because he didn't like Legree, just because he didn't like Pierre uh, D'Alencon? That's possible. It's definitely possible. But I like that they didn't do that in this film. Yeah, I thought they did that for just for filmmaking, just made the plot smoother because they could have gone into lots of legal entanglements and those kind of issues. Then they play it off enough that there's longstanding enmity that builds between Legree and in Carouge and that the Count is on Legree's side. Mm -hmm. Coming out of the film, you could probably have that kind of view, right? But it's not explicit. Yeah, I mean, it's it's a possibility. This is one of the places where I thought the audience might get lost is that right at the beginning, they do a lot of quick cuts that suggest a lot of time passing and a lot of things happening. It's establishing this relationship between Carouge and Legree that is contentious. And I wasn't sure if people would follow that very well. And this is one of the things that I can't say objectively because I've read The Last Duel twice. I read it back in the day and I read it before I spoke to Eric Jagger. So I don't know if people are going to get lost in that. I don't think so. But this is one of the places where it might get confusing. It's a good thing they put in some dates yes. because lots of time passes in between. You know, if, if this was told fictionally, they would not have. Everything would have happened in a much more condensed time span. Yeah. And so it's one of these things where well, the accuracy question is difficult because they try to really stick closely in a lot of ways to Eric Jagger's account of things. And they do that by establishing this enmity and stuff over time. This is also the place where, as we said before, you can throw in medieval warfare for the people who liked Kingdom of Heaven or coming back to Ridley Scott because they want to see more bloody warfare. You do see that and it's horrible. Mm -hmm. But I think that there is a group of people that do come just to see horrific medieval violence. They have a, a tiny bit of a de detour into Scotland. Yeah. I thought that was actually the cheapest shot part of it because basically Scotland is some woods. <laughs> and there's fighting in, in there's a, some English archers, I guess, because they're in a the, the little distance. We don't really you know, see them up close. Yeah. But uh, Scottish people don't come across well in this film, that's for sure. Well, again, I think that is historically okay because it went badly. That campaign went badly. So Karouj came back in bad shape. Okay, so we talked about a lot of minor spoilers. It's time to get into the major spoiler territory. Okay, so if you have listened to the minor spoilers, but you don't want the major spoiler, this is your time to duck out in five, four, three, two, one. Okay, so we see the end of the film and we see the end of the duel, which is really a trial by combat. Yes, Medievalist is a trial by combat. 
I thought that it was filmed well. What did you think, Peter? Yeah, you get set up in this, what we thought was odd was an abandoned monastery. You kind of pointed out that in the book, it's not that. It's a functioning monastery and would have been you know, a great thing. But it's that stadium feel that you yeah. get. They paid some lip service to you know, how the combat gets described. And of course, there's varying different accounts. So we don't, you can't just follow, say, for a Sard's version, right? Because that's yeah. not, you know, might be a related thing like that. But yeah, it's a really kind of dramatic moment. It's good to see how they follow, they're telling all these kind of rules and they're following all the protocols. You even have the two carries about to kill each other, clasp hands, right? <laughs> and yeah, we get like your charge with lances. You get the scene where like a horse gets impaled. Mm-hmm. You know, that's pretty much a medieval trope now. It's not out of the realm of possibility. True, true. And you have this kind of fight in the mud, which yeah. lots, lots of fights seem to be happening in mud in the Middle Ages. Yes. Yeah. And what was your favorite line, your line about the other trial oh, by combat? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so the camp here is like watching in the crowd. He, he turns to the other one like, ah, I hope this one turns out like the one in Flanders. And he references how a, a person got defeated in the most unorthodox way, which was pretty funny. And of course, it's a reference within the book, but the reference is from like a trial by combat that happened in 1127 in Flanders. And there's something I know and something you know, and maybe a thousand other people on this planet know <laughs> about this particular trial by combat. Yeah. So they play it off as like, yeah, oh yeah, we all know about this. Like, there's no way that Count Pierre would have ever like known about this little event that happens. Who knows? Maybe he's a scholar. <laughs> a scholar of trial by combat in <laughs> Flanders, which is not close to where he's living. You mentioned that that I said in the review that it takes place at a dilapidated abbey, which is weird because it took place at Saint-Martin-des-Champs, which is in suburban Paris. (laughs) So it's very alive. And I I think that they were trying to make a statement with that. Also in the film, you have a stone tilt yard and it would have been wood so that people could see. You also have people cheering when we know that they were not allowed to make a sound because this was not, it's not a, a joust it's a trial and so it's like having people in the gallery at a courthouse you're not allowed to speak or make noise but this is all for theatrical reasons i think and we also have marguerite kind of imprisoned i guess on this little tower within this uh, area right to, to watch on because according to the plot if cruz gets killed if he dies she's right away going to get burned you even have the little fire next to her, so like that's that kind of idea that like she was going to be executed is alluded to only by Frossard. Mm-hmm. and he's he's not in a position to make that kind of a comment. He's he's not there. His writing is not necessarily the most reliable. So, but he's a, yeah. he's a good storyteller. That's why we have him all. But it is unlikely that she faced that sentence. Sarah and David mentioned this too, and it's worth mentioning that that always you have laws on the books that will suggest that people will be executed in all sorts of horrible ways. And we know statistically that they weren't. Like, for example, a lot of people who were convicted of murder were not necessarily executed for that or for stealing, they would be exiled instead. So yeah, she was probably never going to be burned, but it is very dramatic. And again, I do expect that the director is going to want to bring people to the movies and this is one of the ways to do it. So she is there. I did like that, you know, they offered this view that she could get killed and there's a slight historical basis for it. This is actually mentioned in a text. Even if, as historians, we kind of look at it and say, it's probably not, but <laughs> it's good enough that like they didn't just take it out of there. <laughs> it's funny. I'm laughing because it reminds me of uh, reading the book, Orange is the New Black, and then watching the show Orange is the New Black. And in the book, there's all of these dramatic things and nothing actually happens. Nothing bad actually happens to the women. And in the show, of course, all sorts of bad things happen. So it's the same kind of thing where if you're telling a story for entertainment, it's going to be a lot more dramatic. So I think you got to expect that, which is why she's up there on a pyre watching the whole thing. 
Now, the fight itself is quite dramatic, right? Like, you have them back and forth, and that's kind of how it gets described in the sources. Yeah, there's a few different sources. So I think that people should go back and listen to the podcast with Eric Jagger because he talks about the decisions he made in writing the book from the three different accounts, how it played out. And nobody actually knows for sure. But for the sake of interest, the people who did the film – choreographed it following Eric's version of events. So Eric kind of filled that in with his imagination based on ideas that he got from the sources, but they're holy. So he's got to fill it in somehow. And the film follows Eric's account pretty closely, I thought. Yeah. And, you know, it gets very tense. Legree is down and Carouge is on top of him. And as in an account, Legree says, I'm innocent. I'm innocent. But even... Karouge has this part where he's like, just between you and me, just tell me you're, mm-hmm. you're guilty. Karouge doesn't really get what he wants. He wants to be admitted right. And Legree calling out that he's innocent really takes a bit of the wind out of Karouge's air. Yes, but in the end, he does win. He's in bleeding the, yeah, profusely, in, but he does win. They're both wounded and they're both really tired. There's purpose, I think, like, like, like Greed could have won, right? Like, yeah. he's just so tired mm-hmm. that he can't go over there and make a quick kill. And then, like, the crowd cheers. The crowd cheers, which is, again, a little weird. A little the, weird. The, <laughs> yeah, you, you have the king. Like, Greed is about to win, and the king's like, kill him, kill him. Yeah. This is Charles the Seventh. The Sixth. Yeah. Sixth. He later has mental illnesses and stuff like that. So they're playing off that, which, as you kind of point out, he didn't quite have it at this time. No, he hadn't had his mental break at this point. He does actually, and Eric mentions this in his book, that Carouge is actually with the King, King Charles, when he has his first break where he thinks he's attacked by people. And that's really interesting. I don't know if he was actually on the spot, but he was with the King, which is kind of an interesting little fact to wade. But one of the things I thought was good about the end of this trial by combat, Legree is defeated, but there were a whole bunch of people in real life, as in the movie, who were cheering for him. They wanted him to win for a lot of reasons, because they liked him or that they thought he was a better combatant, or maybe they thought he was more handsome or whatever. But also the fact that Legree's losing means that he did it, that he was in the wrong, that he is a criminal. And so, of course, his body is dragged off as a criminal's, isn't it? Hanged. But what I really liked was they took a moment. So, really, Scott took a moment to survey the crowd and the people who were cheering for Legree and them having to take in the fact that he's been defeated. And I think this is a really poignant moment when we think about these days when we've had so many fallen heroes where we find out that they are not who we thought they were especially in this kind of a case, countless, countless people who were in Matt Damon and Ben Affleck's orbit. And it's something, I think, to show the faces of people who are disappointed in the people that were not who they thought they were, or even if we're even more cynical, that were discovered doing things that nobody wanted them to be doing. So I thought this was a really good moment in terms of a director's vision to have this in the film. As most of the crowd has gone off at the end. You still have Count Pierre remain behind just to watch as Legree's body is stripped, dragged through the mud. I thought that was a really well done scene. No words either, right? And it's just all visual. Mm-hmm. And as this has happened, then you have this carouge on this hero's journey towards the middle of Paris, mm-hmm. where it seems like the entire city has come out to cheer him on. Yeah. <laughs> and you wonder in real life, as in the film, who they were cheering for. They're cheering for him now. <laughs> who are they cheering <laughs> for when they went into the combat? This is a moment that I think maybe a lot of the comments I'm making other people might agree with. But this one is just my own comment where Marguerite is leaving. She's leaving the trial. She's on her horse and she is very miserable because she's her husband is being celebrated and she knows that her life is going to suck after this too that's a directorial choice that i thought again is not super necessary she could be relieved like we could show her being relieved or happy or a mix of these things but it was really important i think for the director's vision of this that she is not 
She's never happy with the results. This is probably, I think, because her husband has dragged her into this in the first place. But I thought it would have been okay to let her have some yeah. relief. Yeah, she is someone like the day before is very worried. What will happen to our child? This is my world now, the child that we've had. I think, yeah, she would be relieved just on that basis alone. We do get the scene which the child has grown up a little bit and she's watching from the field. Very Hunger Games-esque. Hunger Games? Why do you say that? In the end of the Hunger Games, you have a similar (laughs) scene. Here in the field, the kid is playing and Cruz is now no longer in the picture. Yeah. So it it ends off with her. It's just her and her baby. feeling, Feeling relieved. Cruz dies a few years later. Yes. I don't know how many years later was it. Not a lot. Not a lot. Five or five or six, I bet. Yeah, so, something yeah. like that. He's off fighting. He probably wasn't around very much. Yeah, yeah. She doesn't remarry for her own reasons and stuff like that. And like she has survived this. <laughs> yeah, and it actually says that she has a happy life after that. And it's like, well, we don't know that. <laughs> I mean, I hope she had a happy life. She didn't remarry from what we know. This hangs over her for a long time. Yeah, it's probably not something that she wanted to be reminded of as many times as she was probably reminded of it. But I thought it was it was definitely an interesting choice. It was definitely a choice to put in. She lives happily ever after. I hope she did. But they definitely chose to give her a happy ending. And maybe that's something that we all want for her. As a viewer, you come off with a, at least a bit of a happy ending. It's, it's a bit of a slog emotionally. Yeah, it's a typical. Uh, you know, this is this is not like an easy film to watch. I don't think many medieval films are these days, you know. <laughs> no, like, and that's why A Knight's Tale is everyone's favorite. Yeah, that's true. That's true. Like, bring me back a 1950s Robin Hood film. At the end of A Knight's Tale, you feel good. You don't feel emotionally wrung out. So <laughs> there's that. But overall, I said this on Twitter and in the review, what I look for in a medieval movie is, is it going to bring the people? Are the people going to like it? Not the specialists, but everybody else. Are they going to like it? And then also, is it something that shows medieval people as human beings, not as caricatures or brutes or anything like that? And I think that this film accomplishes it. I think that Ridley Scott's direction is something that people will like. Normal people, <laughs> normal people, not medievalists will like because he's a very talented director. I think that the way that story is told is going to keep people interested. But I really think that we might be getting to a point where people are treating the people of the Middle Ages as being complex people. Do I think that Marguerite was treated as a complex medieval woman Mm, in some ways and not in other ways? But it's better than we have in a lot of other movies. And maybe my standards are too low. But I do think that, again, in the middle of the movie, you forget that it's set in a Middle Ages for the movies. And it's just people. And they're interacting in ways that are, that are complex. And so for me, that makes it a good movie. I think it'll bring the people and make them think. And hopefully it will make them want to learn more about things like trial by combat, about things like what were the laws and how were they prosecuted and what happened to women. And so if it can accomplish these things, to me, it's done its job. And and I did say on the internet as well that I think it's a team effort. We want these movies to bring people to us as historians and we'll take it from there. And so, yeah, I think it accomplished all those things. I think the film will resonate better when people see it in their own homes. When we saw it, we were like in a, a small theater and it was only about eight or nine other people in it. A full theater with that kind of crowd around you, I think it doesn't work as well as then when, if you're going to see it like on Netflix or whatever, I think that will have more of an impact. Hmm. That's interesting. I hadn't thought of that. I would respectfully disagree with you on that one. We watched it in a movie theater with four other people, six other people, like you were saying, and they were literally on the edge of their seats. I was watching them because I was trying to figure out, is this a movie that other people will like? And they were on the edge of their seats because they really were cheering for Marguerite. They wanted her to have her justice and also their moments of tension in in terms of fighting and stuff like that. So yeah, I think that Maybe watching it with other people and getting caught up in that empathy might work. 
It could, like, like you know, you know, we both went into it knowing the end. Yes. <laughs> Unless there was a big shock ending. In that, the, uh, well, you never know. I do think if you're really interested, you'll probably want to watch it a second time, especially to re-watch the scenes shot on two or three occasions where the same scene, scene is done twice or three times. Say the scene where they uh, come to the feast. Yeah. I'd love to kind of take those three scenes and watch them just to see what do they do different. Yes, I think that those scenes, they hinge on the talent of Adam Driver, who has a very difficult job making this character perform in two different ways that are hugely important to the story mm -hmm. that they're telling. So major hats off to Adam Driver. And Jodie Comer, who has to do the same thing, she has to act in two different ways ways well the three but two in the scenes with the two of them that have to tell a complete story that are just pivoting on small small movements of their faces for a lot of it and so the two of them really have a, an amazing performance and i hope that people appreciate how difficult it is to do that yeah the, the performances go to them Matt Damon and Ben Affleck did fine. Uh, you know, they should be more praised just for the writing. And they brought in a third person. This is the first time they've written since Goodwill Hunting yeah. together. Yeah. They should get props for this. Like, I think, you know, everyone on this film should feel pretty proud of what they did. Yes. And definitely should give a shout out to Eric Jagger, who gets like third billing on the credits. And Indeed. I was clapping for you, Eric. <laughs> well done. You gave them a lot of great material to work with. And I think that it is a film that moves us a little bit ahead in terms of medieval movie making. So that's what I think about this movie. And of course, we want people to go see it and tell us what they think on social media. Read the book too, especially if you, you know if you want to learn more. Go and get Eric's book, which is back in the bestsellers list. Yeah, congratulations to him. So yeah, you can read my review. I think this is definitely more thorough. Definitely read uh, Sarah McDougall and David Perry's as well in conjunction with it and see what they say because we're talking about two different things. I think I'm talking more about filmmaking. They're talking more about accuracy, but I think that their points are very, very good and that people should read them. So that is all we have to say about The Last Duel for now. Peter, what's going on on the website this week? So we uh, have a piece about this wine factory. It's in present-day Israel, but about 1,500 years ago, it was a very big deal because it was making like 2 million liters of wine per year. Wow, that is a so, lot. Yeah, doing well in the 6th century, 6th century <laughs> industry. So we have that. We have the story about like the genetic history of a person that's been coined the Segor Bay Giant. And this is a guy who lived in Al Andalus in the 11th century. He's called a giant because he was six foot three. Wow. Pretty tall. Interesting, you know, background to him through ancient DNA analysis. So we have that. And uh, yeah, we also have a couple of children's books. Tell us about those. One by C.J. Adrian about Vikings. So if your little one wants a Viking, we have that. <laughs> and we have a book called Fluffy Night. Uh... Yeah, uh, Nighttime Adventures. Now, it's not quite a medieval story, but, you know, he is a fluffy knight. <laughs> I like Fluffy Nights. Peter is waving around a book with the bear on it, and it's adorable. It's uh, by Lin Lee, and I can't give too much more information, but yeah, there's a connection with MidiPost.net. <laughs> <laughs> there's uh, two characters called Mickey and Michael. I may have known them for 40 years. <laughs> Peter is being shy. Lynn is the person who tells Peter not to wipe his hands on his pants <laughs> when he's eating. <laughs> Congratulations to you, Lynn, on that book. And, and uh, that's her first book, and it's now on Amazon. Yes, and that is the good news. We do have a bit of sad news this week, which is the passing of Derek Pearsall. So a lot of us are feeling that. So our condolences to his family. He was a giant in our field. Indeed, indeed. More news about that as well in about a week or so. Thanks, Peter, for coming on talking about The Last Duel. Always a pleasure to see you. Thanks. <laughs> the Last Duel is currently out in movie theaters everywhere. You can find Eric Jagger's book, The Last Duel, A True Story of Crime, Scandal, and Trial by Combat in Medieval France at bookstores worldwide. For people who happen to love my books, I have both a tiny bit of bad news and a bunch of good news. The bad news is that global shipping delays have pushed the release date of How to Live Like a Monk, Medieval Wisdom for Modern Life 
back once again, which means that the book will be coming to you November 16th. It's a bummer, I know, because I really, really want to get this book into your hands. But honestly, it's nobody's fault but COVID-19s. So thank you for all your patience, a virtue much in keeping with the theme of the book. But I promised you some good news, so here it is. In response to your overwhelming support in pre-ordering the book, my publisher, Abbeville Press, has decided to release both an ebook and an audiobook version of How to Live Like a Monk in addition to the hardcover. This is super exciting news for me in pretty much every respect, not least of all because it'll be my first audiobook, so you can continue to listen to my dulcet tones in your cars and on your treadmills this winter. I'm also really excited that this opens up a whole lot more accessibility, and that is such a great thing. It's not every day that a publisher is willing to invest in alternate publication formats for a historian's self-help book about monks, so it really is down to all the support that you've shown in the pre-orders, and I really want to thank you from the bottom of my heart. Stay tuned as we get closer to the new release date, because I might just happen to have more goodies for you. Thank you, of course, as always, to the people who are supporting the Medieval Podcast on Patreon.com. We have great stuff there, like subscriptions to Medieval Warfare magazine and the Medieval magazine, our book club, and the exclusive maps that Tina Ross creates for us fresh every month, and which I always look forward to getting in my inbox. To find out how you can become a patron of the Medieval Podcast if you aren't one already, please visit patreon.com slash medievalists. For everything from movies to minstrels, follow Medievalist.net on Facebook or Twitter at Medievalists. You can find me, Danielle Sabalski, on social media at 5MIN Medievalist or 5 Minute Medievalist. And you can find my books at all your favorite online bookstores, where you can even pre-order How to Live Like a Monk, Medieval Wisdom for Modern Life in all its many forms very soon. Our music is Beyond the Warriors by Guy Frog. Thanks for listening, and have yourself a fantastic day. Music